Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak, uh, Vice President for Scholars at the Wilson Center, and I also direct uh, uh, International Security Studies. Welcome to today's meeting, which is another in our ongoing series, uh, the Nonproliferation Forum that, that the Center co-sponsors with our uh, longstanding and highly valued institutional partner, uh, the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, today's topic is the role of tacit knowledge in WMD proliferation, past and present. Uh, I know a number of uh, uh, individuals are joining us on this live webcast, some from uh, the Los Alamos you know, home, uh, <clears throat> home office in, uh, in New Mexico, and we welcome those participating uh, kind of re remotely in that way. Um, I'm, it's a particular pleasure to, uh, it's, it's, it's delighted that Michael Dennis, who uh, uh, has an adjunct uh, faculty position at Georgetown, is joining us today, but particular pleasure uh, that Kathleen Vogel, who's one of the center's uh, uh, residential uh, fellows uh, is participating in today's event, and this is is in considerable measure, you know, drawn from the research project that she's been undertaking, you know, here under the center's auspices. So, with that, um, uh, let me turn the uh, microphone over to uh, the co-chair of the series, Dr. Joseph Pilat of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, who will say a few words about today's topic to tee it up, and then introduce our speaker. So, over to Joe. Thank you, Rob. Let me offer a welcome from the Los Alamos National Laboratory and from myself personally. Tacit knowledge, um, which I understand as unwritten, unspecified, or perhaps unexplained knowledge, know-how in many respects, passed on through mentoring, apprenticeships, and the like, um, is a concept developed in the philosophy of science and social sciences, but uh, there has been growing interest in its application to the study of WMD proliferation and terrorism. It can offer insights into the past, into problems or failures of proliferation programs from those of Nazi Germany to more recently Libya. It can help us understand the limited incidents and consequences of WMD terrorism, the activities of Om Shinrikyo in particular. For present and future, the concept has implications for intelligence collection and analysis, as well as for developing policies to combat WMD proliferation and terrorism. It can provide insights for assessing the human and material needs, as well as the time frames of proliferant programs for assessing roles, limits, and vulnerabilities of non-state supplier networks, and for assessing prospects for WMD terrorism and the groups most likely to pursue it. On the basis of such insight, insights, we may be able to develop uh, more realistic responses to proliferation and terrorism threats uh, that uh, take into account the scarce resources that the government will have available to it in the years to come. We're very fortunate to have with us today two young scholars who are doing some pioneering work in the use of this concept in the WMD area. As Rob noted, uh, Kathleen Vogel, who is a senior fellow in the International Security Studies Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, she's on sabbatical leave from the Cornell University where she's an associate professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies and the Judith Ruppe Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. We saw, have Michael Dennis, who's an adjunct instructor at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at Georgetown University, and he has been um, previously at the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Virginia Tech, visiting assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University, and assistant professor at Cornell University. Kathleen, we'll start with you. Right, well thank you so much, and um, thank you so much also to the Wilson Center for giving us the opportunity to, to talk a bit about um, uh, this issue of tacit knowledge and also for the opportunity just to be here over this past year and, um, and work on, on my project. Um, as has been described, my project um, here at the Wilson Center is to try and create a new set of unclassified discussions between academic and other non-government experts uh, and intelligence analysts to look at how WMD assessments can involve a better integration, a better synthesis of both social and technical factors 
um, uh, and uh, you know how that might be able to provide new sets of information, new sets of expertise uh, to improve the accuracy of WMD assessments uh, in the hopes that these might also then lead to better uh, national security policy making. Um, one issue uh, in particular to these uh, meetings that I've been working on during my time here at the Wilson Center um, has been this, this issue, the role of tacit knowledge uh, or uh, what's commonly referred to as maybe technical know-how um, and uh, how this relates to biological and nuclear weapons uh, development and proliferation. And um, as many of you are aware, this issue is quite salient to a number of current WMD concerns from you know, a lot of the coverage recently about you know, how, how to make sense of Iran's nuclear program uh, to concerns about advances in biotechnology and you know, whether um, uh, these technologies are posing new and more dangerous threats than they have in the past. And um, both of these cases as well as others raise uh, really important questions about the extent to which know-how in our increasingly um, globalized um, world um, you know, whether and to what extent that is still uh, relevant or important to understanding um, current bioweapons and nuclear threats, you know, whether we're talking about a state or non-state program. Um, and so uh, this has been one focal point for my, the meetings that I've been uh, organizing here at the Wilson Centers on this particular issue. Um, now in pulling these uh, meetings together uh, here at the Wilson Center, Michael Dennis has been my partner in crime uh, because he's spent a quite a bit of his career um, analyzing and teaching about tacit knowledge issues, and he's part of, uh, I was thinking about, might be part of this, uh, what I might describe as a Cornell Mafia, uh, who has an interest in these issues of, of tacit knowledge in the Science and Technology Studies program there. Um, and so what I'd like to do now, um, we're both gonna talk about different issues related to tacit knowledge in nuclear and biological weapons development. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael now first to talk about um, some issues in, in literature, what the science technology studies literature has to say about tacit knowledge and how this relates to um, what he's more familiar with, which is uh, nuclear weapons issues. And then I'll come back to offer a couple of different examples of how we can think about this in the biological weapons case as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Partner in crime is not something I've been described as before. Um, okay, uh, what I plan on doing is talking a little bit about what tacit knowledge is and is not some examples and some of the reasons why I think it is <clears throat> a different way to think about uh, non-proliferation issues. Just to give an example of what we're talking about, several years ago uh, the during the W76 nuclear warhead life extension program, uh, a problem emerged. Uh, a substance called fog, fog bank is essential to making the warhead work. As far as I can tell, it's part of the Teller Ulam device, but you know, don't quote me on that. It's pretty bad. This is on the web. Um, the problem was is that no one knew how to make it anymore. The engineers who had made it had retired. The machines that had made it at Oak Ridge were largely kind of sitting there rusting. NNSA made some estimates that it would take a year or two to refurbish the machines and remanufacture the material. Now, we only know about this problem because we can read uh, the heavily redacted uh, DOE and GAO um, audit reports. But it turned out that making fog bank was a lot more difficult than one or two years. Indeed, it became a five-year program in which, out of desperation at various points, uh, it turned out that the W76 warhead refurbishment was delayed. Uh, given that it's the key part of the uh, SLBM force, uh, a major part of our deterrent, it was a real problem. Now, my favorite part of this story is that in addition to the fact that NNSA seemed to believe that since they had a recipe on file, they would follow the recipe. Now, what this reveals is either A, everybody at NNSA is a male of a certain age who has never had to actually cook for themselves. Uh, because if you've ever cooked, you know that the recipe is necessary but not sufficient. Um, and it turned out, by the way, that it was more than the recipe that was the problem. Uh, my favorite part is that the ingredients in the 50s were, uh, how should I put this, impure, that uh, they had lots of contaminants, just like good silicon has to be doped. Turned out fog bank had to be doped too. Recovering the doping turned out to be an incredible exercise in both finding those retired engineers, 
remanufacturing the equipment and bringing all that together. That's a great example of tacit knowledge, which is, look, it's not voodoo. It's really simple. It's that you know more than you can say. Okay, I just gave the example of cooking. The classic example is riding your bicycle. Um, to those of you who do it, uh, one that actually moves, not the stationary kind, okay? Um, but that is, tacit knowledge is knowledge that you don't actually talk about. It's not that it can't be written down, although you can imagine what it would be like to write down how to ride a bicycle. If any of you have taught your niece or nephew or your sons or daughters when you take off the training wheels, you know that there is a certain point beyond which the words fail, right? You have to push the kid. I just did this this past weekend for my niece. Uh, I have vivid memories of it. Uh, trust me, she did not enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> but now she can ride a bike in Central Park, and, you know, she can ride down a hill. It's quite impressive, actually. Uh, she didn't pick it up. It's not impossible, but it does take time. And that's really the basic point about tacit knowledge. It's about time. Uh, Kathleen and I went to a conference several months ago, and people want to know, is tacit knowledge a showstopper? That is, and I kept looking at them and wondering what planet they were from. Now I know they're from the NIC. Uh, and I said, no, it's a show slower. Because what tacit knowledge is is stuff we learn how to do, okay? And there's a great deal of irony in us talking about tacit knowledge. It's a concept that was invented by the emigre British physical chemist, uh, Michael Polanyi. And he did it for one reason and one reason only. He was terrified of government planning of science. So he invented this notion of personal knowledge to literally say, unless you're a scientist, you can't be involved in the planning of science. It's part of the whole notion of the autonomy of science. And we bought into that largely. I mean, that's, after all, what Vannevar Bush wanted, although he certainly didn't get it. Now, how does this apply to nuclear weapons? First off, uh, clearly the people who built the Manhattan Project did not have tacit knowledge of how to build nuclear weapons, but they had tacit knowledge of how to do other things that were readily transferable. First off, management. We've all worked for bad managers. Indeed, most of us only work for bad managers. But um, at least if Dilbert is to be believed, and I take that as an authority. Um, <laughs> but the point is this. Uh, management, I mean, Groves had built the Pentagon. It's kind of ironic. He was, after all, the second choice. Thank goodness the first guy decided to pass. Uh, but it, the ability to know how to do a large-scale construction enterprise did matter. But tacit knowledge also existed at the level of technical detail. I mean, one thing that everyone who worked on the Manhattan Project had in common in the technical side was they had all built a ham radio during the 30s. I mean, we've forgotten this, uh, but every male <laughs> built a crystal radio. Every male knew how to read a circuit diagram. Okay, now the other great thing for the Manhattan Project was, I hate to put it this way, was the Great Depression. Um, the Great Depression was the ultimate agent of selection pressure in physics. You had to be either independently wealthy, so Alfred Loomis, okay, or you had to be really, really good to survive, to get a pre-doc, to get a post-doc, Remember, those NRC fellowships had dried up pretty much in the 30s. People went to work at Lawrence's laboratory, uh, you know, largely, I mean, a, I know this will shock you, a graduate fellowship at Berkeley in the 30s was like 250 to $500 plus tuition, which wasn't much more. That was for 12 months, okay? Remember, full professors were lucky if they earned $4,000 a year. My favorite story is... Uh, at Johns Hopkins, when they wanted to hire uh, somebody, he demanded $6,000, and Isaiah Bowman made his traditional anti-Semitic comment and said, no, 4000 is all I pay physicists. Um, so tacit knowledge uh, if for the generation that built the bomb was literally built in their physics curriculum. By the way, I mean, one thing we've forgotten in our age of now of websites, but of catalogs. Remember, there's no catalog like uh, where you can go order all the lab equipment as we do today. Instead, physicists like James Van Allen, um, even the Cornell physicists I worked with when I taught there, 
They made a lot of their own equipment, modified existing. That produced uh, a robust set of knowledge that's literally in your hands, okay? How to make things. And by the way, there are theoretical cultures of tacit knowledge as well. One of the things we've learned from studying different sites is that different research groups, all of you are familiar with this, have different styles of research, okay? I mean, the best example of this is, comes from the history of Livermore, right? Livermore, as you know, is one of the upshots of the uh, H-bomb debate. But the thing about Livermore is, is that when they are established, they decide, we're going to show you can, you know, we don't need Los Alamos at all. We should make everybody at Los Alamos feel good. We don't need you at all. We're going to build weapons without any help from you guys. What happened to the first two Livermore devices? Well, they didn't even bring down the tower. It was just like in Iraq, you know, in Baghdad where they used the jeep to pull down the statue of Saddam Hussein. The Livermore guys, you know, used a truck to pull down the tower. Their two fizzles came on. Fortunately, Los Alamos guys were there to capture that on film and to hold it against Livermore researchers for the rest of their lives. But the thing is this, why? Livermore people's excuse is always, oh, we were going for high-yield, high-tech things. More mundane reason, why did their first two devices fizzle? They didn't have the experience of building bombs. You want to build bombs, you have to actually build them. I can give you every paper. It is insufficient, okay? No paper can have all the details, okay? Now, I mean, everyone goes, oh, the Manhattan Project is that special. Okay, fine. Let's talk about proliferation. In, we have, to date talked about it in terms of materials, uh, right? So, and let's be honest, we played a major role in proliferation with Atoms for Peace by choosing to sell everybody in a, an enriched uranium reactor as opposed to a natural one. But forget that for a moment. Um, proliferation is about transplanting these networks of skills into a new context. Every nuclear power, up until the Libyan case, has had to recreate all the tacit knowledge that the Manhattan Project had to, although they've got some real benefits. For example, the Smythe Report. When you read the Smythe Report, you do learn a great deal. You don't learn about the physical chemistry of how to separate uh, plutonium from the waste stream of your atomic pile, as they were called then, but you learn that you need uh, plutonium is different than uranium, U-235, you do learn a great deal, okay? Uh, I mean, in a sense, you could argue that the Smythe Report gave the Soviet Union far more than Klaus Fuchs did. Um, but the thing is, uh, after all, remember, the Soviet Union doesn't even bother to build an enriched uranium device at first. They just go for plutonium. You know, only the Chinese decide, oh, let's make an enriched uranium device at first. But um, the thing that's striking is that they have to recover all the tacit knowledge. And what's even better is we know that, think of it like this, the British and the Russians have the same exact source, right? Klaus Fuchs, except the British had him as a physical entity, whereas the Russians only had him as pieces of paper. It took both of them roughly the same amount of time to recreate the work from the Manhattan Project. and take took the British even longer because they were terrified of something that we took for granted the arming of the weapon in flight. The British realized that our designs and what they had learned were all based on the notion that someone would have to get into the back of the plane and actually arm the bomb. They freaked out over this and believed that the weapon was just going to detonate in flight and kill the crew. Hence, they changed the design of their bomb dramatically. More recently, we've heard rumor of the so-called turnkey device, uh, that is, A.Q. Khan selling the Libyans this turnkey system, which then Libya forsook. Um, can I be honest? I think one of the things you should take home from this is really never buy a bomb kit from anybody online. <laughs> um, I, I hate to be blunt, but if you're really worried about this, you really need to get more in your life. Um, look. The notion that you're going to sell someone a kit, and Khan actually, at least according to the Post, my source here, so and the Times, so I could be wrong. I have no clearance, and trust me, I'm not going to get one. Um, <laughs> it is this. 
he was going to sell apparently part of it, the machining of plutonium. I hate to break it to you, but the machining of plutonium is one of those aspects of tacit knowledge that we invested a fortune in. It's like the machining of beryllium for inertial guidance systems. It's an art. Okay, those guys at the old iLab, now the Draper Laboratory, those old geezers now, the ones who are still are alive, who didn't get the beryllium poisoning, they are masters of a craft, just as the people at Hanford and at Savannah River who learned how to literally machine the fissile materials in the, both the pits that we're now refurbishing and the spheres, okay? So the notion that you're going to sell someone a turnkey kit that's going to do this is an absurdity. I mean, the thing about the Libyan program was simply that it literally was just the boxes. There was there were no people, and tacit knowledge is about people. Now, the most important thing about people, though, here is that, uh, for whatever it's worth, we're not just talking physicists. Everybody who's worked in the laboratory knows this, that the guy who runs the lab is not doing the work. Okay? It's the graduate students, it's the postdocs, and most importantly, it's the technicians. So you're going to hear from Kathleen's examples, but we can say from my own work is it's the technicians who make this stuff. Okay, You don't have, uh, for whatever, when Hans Bethe said famously, and said it to me several times, and I'm fortunate to hear it from his mouth, we could not have built the weapon without Oppenheimer. I always went, but who else? And he would always say the same thing, SED, Special Explosives, Special Experimental Devices Officers. That is, the enlisted men who were the technicians, the SED officers. They, he said, were actually the core of the bomb project. Without them, they're about 1,700. He said, we wouldn't have had anything. Okay? You need a manager, yes. You need someone who knows the problem. But you need these people who have these skills these are skills that are only acquired over time. They are literally embodied. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, you know, as thinking about this today, yes, box cakes have gotten really, really good. Okay, as someone who has to make them for their nieces and nephews for their birthdays, if they're good for you know my eleven-year-old niece thinks my cakes are great. I know that they're not nearly as good as the cakes my mother made from scratch when I was growing up because she learned at the Academy of Cuisine over years how to make a cake. My mom can do stuff with a frying pan that I can only imagine, okay? Now, one thing to make sure is that what counts as tacit knowledge changes over time, okay? One of the things that's striking about the development of nuclear weapons is this. What counts as tacit knowledge has changed. When we were testing, what mattered the most was not actually the result of the test, it was the match of the software codes and the test. That is, how we calibrated our simulations with the reality. That's a different kind of tacit knowledge, okay? Just like in a biology laboratory today, if you read science every week, you know that you can buy a PCR kit for whatever now. PCR used to be something that in every laboratory, there was usually one technician who had what they referred to as golden hands, they could make the PCR reaction work every time. And usually everybody else kind of just let it, it was a bowl of jello. Now, I don't have to be have golden hands anymore to make PCR work. Indeed, I've actually done it myself. Yay. Uh, what I have to know is how do I make the kit I've purchased online generally work? That's a different kind of tacit knowledge, okay? So it changes. It's not the same. But the key th point we want you to leave with is it is experiential, it is embodied, and it takes time. It is, as I told those people at the Nick conference, it's a show slower, okay? Not a show stopper. I'm pretty sure there aren't that many of them. Anyway, I'll turn it over to my partner in crime, <laughs> Kathleen. Okay, well, I, uh, my, I may not be quite as humorous, but I can show you a couple of different examples. You got um, pictures. Talking, I can show pictures. Uh, maybe not as much humor. Um, but I can talk to you a little bit about cases uh, that I've been looking at related to my own research on biological weapons issues where we can sort of see again this role of tacit knowledge, this role of embodied knowledge, and, and how it shapes both um, state 
uh, bioweapons programs, and um, also we can talk about this whole issue of advances in biotechnology as well. So the, the two examples that I'm going to talk about um, are uh, the Soviet bioweapons program and then an example from uh, synthetic genomics, uh, which I've worked on. And so as probably many of you uh, are aware in this room, probably have heard, heard about the Soviet uh, bioweapons program. And, um, you know, as we know, it was um, quite an extensive program, a covert program um, that uh, developed during the Cold War and then continued um, in the early post-Cold War period. And um, again, we know from different reports um, that this program involved uh, something like over 40 different facilities spread across the former Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, I think, again, you know, with the number of thousands of different weapon scientists who both did research development and uh, produced and weaponized um, these agents. And, you know, I think if you look at the historical record, I think there's no question that the Soviet bioweapons program was uh, the largest bioweapons program in history. Um, uh, and, um, if, and in terms of my own research, I've been interested in looking at, okay, how do we, how can we think about know-how, how can we understand know-how that was a part of that uh, particular program. And so in terms of my own work, I've done interviews with uh, former Soviet bioweapon scientists, and in these interviews what you see is some very interesting aspects of know-how, both kind of an individual type of know-how um, held by individual scientists, um, kind of more teamwork kind of know-how that you see kind of spread across teams of scientists working together, and then, uh, as Michael has mentioned, also other types of kind of interesting organizational and management kind of know-how that was central to um, how they made their weapons. And so I'd just like to talk to you about, you know, one example of this. Uh, let me see if I can pull this PowerPoint up. Uh, from one case that I have uh, looked at um, in my own research, and this is the Stepnogorsk production facility uh, that was uh, located in Kazakhstan. Um, this particular facility uh, was set up uh, to develop essentially the Soviet's uh, premier anthrax weapon. It was called um, the Anthrax 836 strain. Um, and uh, originally when this facility uh, was created in the 1980s, this facility was essentially tasked to mass produce the Soviet's anthrax weapon um, that was originally developed by their Ministry of Defense, by their MOD uh, research institutes. And so when this facility was established um, in the 1980s, um, the, Ministry of the Soviet Ministry of Defense essentially uh, provided um, this facility and the staff that were there with a lot of detailed technical information about scientific work that they had been doing to develop um, anthrax in other uh, facilities. And so they sent them uh, something like 400 pages of very detailed technical in information about um, anthrax, um, you know, and, and uh, different experimental um, issues related to that. Uh, but what's interesting about this particular facility um, is that in spite of a lot of this very detailed technical information, um, the staff at Stepnogors actually struggled for about two years trying to um, basically use this very detailed technical information to make it work uh, at this facility um, in Kazakhstan. And they were actually unable over a two-year period to make any kind of weapon at this facility. And so because of this, because of the <coughs> struggles, uh, the Ministry of Defense then said, okay, obviously this technical information is not sufficient. And what they did actually then is they dispatched um, a little over 60 of basically their expert anthrax scientists and engineers uh, from different institutes um, in the former Soviet Union. Um, these were experts who were very specialized in anthrax cultivation and anthrax production, as well as in different aspects of testing and weaponization of the material. And so they sent this team of people um, to this facility in Stepnogorsk. And what you find is that these, when these um, scientists came to this facility, uh, they were able to solve uh, some of the different technical issues that had hampered um, the staff at Stepnogorsk. But then they also stumble into a lot of unexpected problems as well, uh, trying to get this <coughs> protocol to work in this different facility. And so it took an, a three more additional years of really intensive work by these experts uh, before they could actually then produce this strain at this facility uh, in large quantities. And so if you look at the time frame, it took um, Stepnogorsk, this facility, five years to make the anthrax uh, weapon, um, which is actually longer than it took to make the Soviet's nuclear weapon, which was based on an entirely new technology. This anthrax technology was based on uh, protocols and things that are already existing. So it's kind of interesting to sort of look and say, okay, what, you know, what was the difficulty here? It should have been a very easy transfer of information and transfer of knowledge, but yet there's something more complicated going on on the ground. 
And so I was very interested to sort of further probe, okay, what was going on? Uh, what was it that was causing these problems uh, in this uh, particular facility? And you know what I found through some, it's difficult to make this weapon uh, at this facility. Um, initially, when this facility was first created, they had a very small staff. There were only about um, 40 staff members there, and there were only about four or five of them that really had any kind of scientific or, or engineering kind of background. And basically, only one or two of them had actual bioweapons experience or expertise. Uh, most of them did not. And they didn't, most of their staff also didn't have any experience with large scale production processes. Um, so, from the very beginning, you know, you had a staff that had uh, very little. Um, detailed understanding of actually how to make a biological weapon or even a large-scale uh, weapon. And, and so you can understand then why then it was so valuable when the Ministry of Defense uh, transported these over 60 people then to this facility to provide that very specialized, detailed weapons knowledge. And what they did is when they transferred these people, um, they basically put them in very senior sort of technical positions, managerial positions over different processes at this facility. And they also served as master trainer, so they would actually physically go with the staff at Steptogorus with some of the new <coughs> personnel that were hired. They would literally work with them and show them this is how you cultivate, this is how you produce, this is how you test. Um, uh, so this uh, transfer and uh, this training by these experts um, was very critical, a, a critical piece to getting this technology actually work at this facility. Um, one of the other challenges that emerged with this facility as well is um, the need to translate these existing protocols. So there were these very detailed protocols, but they didn't uh, work at this particular facility. Um, a lot of that had to do with the fact that this um, facility, in terms of the infrastructure, was quite different than other um, facilities uh, in the former Soviet Union that had worked with this anthrax uh, bacteria. Um, when this facility was established, it was established not necessarily with this particular goal in mind, so there was a lot of sort of ad hoc connections between different types of infrastructure and different equipment there that had to be sort of worked out. And so because of that, these scientists, these experts who came over actually had to literally translate and reinterpret these protocols that worked in a different location, how they would actually work in this new location. Um, and, you know, one of the issues was scaling up uh, this technology. In the previous facilities, um, they'd worked with a, a, lo a lower capacity, whereas at this facility they wanted to make these 20,000 liters of anthrax. Uh, and it wasn't a simple just double the recipe. They actually had to basically redo every aspect of the weaponization process to get it to work in this larger um, scale. And this required a lot more just fundamental basic research, applied research to translate um, this to work in this new um, concept. And then coordinating all of this work to work in this facility that was not, uh, when it was established, was not originally set up to do this particular kind of task. Um, so again, you know, you see how uh, even though there was a lot of very detailed information that was available to these scientists in Kazakhstan, um, they essentially had to recreate um, this particular technology to work. And so the existing protocols, they could serve as kind of a guide or as a sort of a very loose schematic map, but they weren't a sort of a detailed how-to guide as to how to make this uh, weapon. And I think it's, it's interesting to sort of take this into account in terms of thinking about, you know, local, local knowledge, local context, and how that shapes um, weapons development or, or weapons uh, proliferation. If you look at, you know, a lot of the different reports about the Soviet program, you know, dating back to the, you know, late 1990s when a lot of them started coming out. Essentially what you see is a lot of descriptions about the Soviet program, a description about a lot of the facilities, um, a lot of, in those reports, assumptions about sort of a homogenous character um, and uh, about the facility and about the complex. But, you know, what I found in terms of my own research is there was actually a lot of variability um, within the program. Um, uh, so a lot of my research on uh, the Stepnogorsk facility as well as um, I have a collaborator, Sonia Gormley at George Mason, who I've worked with also on this. And she, um, if you're interested, she's published a, a relevant, uh, interesting relevant article in International Security this month that um, sort of talks more about this issue of tacit knowledge. And through our own research, what we find is the Soviet program, even though it was quite large, there were a lot of facilities, it, you know, um, they did accomplish certain things, but it was actually very uneven um, in its outputs. Um, what we find is that, for example, one institute, if you look at the institute level, one institute, for example, had a management style that really promoted scientific innovation, created a lot of very interesting work arrangements and incentives 
um, that would actually facilitate uh, weapons tasks. Um, whereas you have, you know, another uh, weapons facility that had a management structure that really stymied and really um, uh, inhibited uh, weapons development. Um, and so what you see then is that know-how, the development of know-how really varied institute by institute in, in this program. And, and this also caused problems in, in terms of transferring this know-how to different facilities. You couldn't just assume transferring to one institute to another, it would be an easy transfer because there, there was a very different sort of culture, as Michael has talked about, different kind of management style that affected the ability to, to transfer this know-how. And, um, and this caused a lot of problems in terms of um, making developments and accomplishments in their uh, weapons program. And this is, again, if we think about they had a huge amount of time, uh, they had a lot of resources, and it was a covert program. Um, so it had a lot of secrecy in some respects that it could potentially benefit from, and yet there were still a lot of problems. Um, you know, other aspects, again, if you look um, at different characteristics of the Soviet program, you find that um, the Soviet economic plan, which was the, as we know, the standard, uh, the common five-year plan, you would think that that would promote in, in innovation and accomplishment, but in uh, the Soviet bioweapons program, what you find is actually in certain cases it made procurement of materials and equipment very difficult. And some of these institutes uh, developed these very odd sort of research practices because they had to deal with this five-year plan that really was not um, conducive to uh, accomplishing a lot of, of, of their weapons work. Um, and secrecy also, uh, what we find in terms of some <coughs> of these facilities had some very negative impacts. You find scientists who actually, uh, because of secrecy, for various reasons, faked results. Um, you know, did experiments that w didn't lead to weapons development. Um, so again, you know, secrecy, although it can, in some ways, promote uh, d weapons development. In other cases, you can see there's a more complicated picture that goes on, kind of behind the scenes. Um, so what we, you know, I and you know some others who were working in this area have found that the Soviet program is actually quite fragile and uneven. Um, and you can't make sort of blanket assumptions about the program in general if you look um, at some of the details. Um, but that you miss that if you're only looking at sort of counting the number of facilities, counting the number of scientists. Um, uh, and I think that that's been one of the problems with, in terms of some of the, the nonproliferation programs um, uh, that have been geared to um, this, you know, to dealing with the aftermath of, of this program. There's been problems in sort of how do you target the right people if you don't sort of know more details and specifics about what these institutes actually did and, and who was actually critical um, to this work. Um, so that's one case study I think that we can talk about uh, more if you're interested um, related to know-how. Um, another that I kind of want to bring into more kind of a contemporary discussion is talking about sort of developments in synthetic genomics um, and sort of talk about how, again, issues of know-how are still salient to sort of thinking about um, uh, these issues. And one case study that I've looked at uh, in detail is um, the 2002 synthesis of the uh, artificial polio virus. Um, this is one of the first kind of synthetic genomic experiments that really triggered a lot of security concerns. Um, uh, when this experiment was published in Science, there was a lot of debate about whether it should have been published, similar to some of the H5N1 controversies that are happening now. Um, and a lot of the concern was directed to the fact that the experimental protocol was published in the scientific literature, in the open scientific literature. The fact that it, this experiment used commercially available pieces of DNA and other um, commercial pieces of equipment and materials um, uh, and used some common kind of molecular biology techniques. Um, that was sort of the focal point of security concern. Um, and so I became interested in sort of understanding, okay, if this experiment is a concern, you know, how can we understand know-how or the relevance of know-how in this experiment? So I um, took a closer look at some of the, you know, what went on in this particular experiment. Um, and, uh, you know, what I found actually is, again, a more complicated picture than, um, you know, what, what you see sort of represented more publicly. And so this is a diagram here of just an overview of the experiment. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of it, um, but more just to sort of point out, a lot of the sort of policy and sort of press focus when this experiment came out was focused kind of on this first, the top part of this experiment, the fact that you could buy these pieces of DNA, you could, you know, basically use common molecular biology techniques to stitch them together, et cetera. 
But what I found when I did my own sort of interviews with um, not only scientists working in this laboratory, but then other related scientists, virologists who work in this area, you know, what I found actually is this bottom part of the experiment, which was really never talked about in um, these different public accounts, this bottom part is actually quite critical to get this experiment to work as it's published. Um, and um, kind of the one of the more critical components of these little test tubes, the solution that's in these little test tubes, and how do you make that solution? Um, and as I looked at this experiment in more detail, you know, what I found is to make that little solution, which seems so easy in this kind of schematic, you know, diagram, is actually quite difficult. Um, and it's not that there aren't sort of, you know, very specific pieces of information out about it. There's a lot of very detailed uh, protocols about how to make the solution in the open literature, and it's actually this information at, to make the solution has been available for uh, over 20 years. Uh, there's a lot of um, sort of methods, uh, journals, and papers, and volumes that talk about how to make the solution. But even with that, it's very difficult to do. Um, it takes a very uh, specialized kind of know-how to make that solution. Um, and to make it to work for this experiment, it really, that know-how is resonant within a very specialized community of polyvirologists who do synthetic research. It's not just a general community of virologists. It's a very localized kind of practice. Um, and it's not something that you can pick up just by uh, reading the paper. It's very skill-based skill um, uh, that's obtained by working with sort of experienced practitioners in the lab, and typically in the labs that I interviewed, they have essentially one senior technician who's been in the lab for 15 to 20 years who's the person that makes the solution, and that's how they get it to work. Um, and if, you know, again, if, if um, you're not able to you know, use this skill, um, then you're not gonna be able to replicate this experiment as it's been published. Um, and that even these expert labs, though, still at times have problems you know, replicating, making the solution. Um, and that really hasn't changed. I would say even today, 10 years later, that part hasn't changed. Um, uh, so again, you know, by looking and sort of really having a focal point on know-how and really trying to unpack that and study it in depth, um, what you see is a more complicated picture than I think kind of general discussions about know-how that you see in sort of popular uh, press and, and policy commentaries. And, you know, in using this example, it is not to say, I think as Michael has mentioned, that, you know, this concept of tacit knowledge and how it works is stationary that, you know, just because it, this particular solution-making part was difficult, that that doesn't mean that every experiment is gonna play out like this. But I think it does point to the fact that you need to go beyond just what's written in the literature to actually look at what happens in the lab and what know-how uh, consists of. Um, so I think, you know, just to sort of uh, wrap things up a little bit, I think a lot of what our work, this project that we're trying to do, is to sort of focus attention on these issues of know-how by using um, and talking about different case studies and using both historical and contemporary examples to really sort of tease out, you know, how is it that know-how works in a specific case and, and looking at some of the different sort of details, the conditions, the resources, the time scales that are involved in different aspects of how you develop skills and know-how. Um, and, you know, the importance of that for understanding proliferation. I think a lot of times there's a lot of generalizations when you talk about know-how, but very little that's focused on sort of working out um, very specific um, examples. Um, and so I think what I'm gonna do is just to sort of try and help facilitate discussion. I just kind of uh, end there, but definitely would open up and welcome discussion sort of on this um, by the audience. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn discussion up. There will be microphones, so uh, please wait for them. Um, second, uh, identify yourself and your institution. Yes, right up here. Thanks, because I have to leave soon. But I'd like to get two quick technical questions in. Uh, Robert Shredder with Golden Seal Enterprises. The first, Michael, for you would be, uh, I, I like your analogy about uh, baking a cake, but uh, mothers do successfully pass the recipes on to their daughters uh, in many instances. So my question really is, how, how large a community of technicians in the nuclear field are we probably talking about worldwide today? And is it growing? And, and Kathleen, if I could turn to you, um, you, to replicate some of these examples that you used that, where they were trying to reproduce mm -hmm. uh, using the same facilities, was it complicated because today they were more concerned with safety issues 
mm-hmm. both for the technicians working and even the possibility of, you know, a release of some of these materials to the greater public. Um, if there was less concern with safety, mm-hmm. could it have been done quicker? Mm-hmm. Well, you uh, one thing I would say is that m- m- mothers also sometimes try to pass those things on to their sons, even if they're not as successful. Um, uh, I think uh, the universe of people we're talking about, I don't know the size of the population of technicians, but what I've always been struck by is the following. When uh, Donald McKenzie and Graham Spinotti did their classic study of tacit knowledge of nuclear weapons design uh, in the early 90s, but, but based on interviews in the 80s, they made a pretty bold claim, which was backed up from their data, which is that they felt that there were only, and this is a pretty important, only 50 people in the United States who were really seen by their peers as being weapons designers. That is, people whose designs would be seen as viable from the get-go. And they also made it, I also learned something else at a conference I went to, not with them, but with Los Alamos people at Cornell, which was the process of taking what I was told is a top flight astrophysicist and turning them into a weapons designer was at a minimum 10 years, minimum, they said, Um, which I was sort of struck by as being a substantial amount of one's professional life just to be good enough to, you know, go to the chalkboard. As for technicians, I would say that I don't see any reason to think that it takes any less time to become proficient. I would say, though, that division of labor matters here, right? That is, we don't probably do not have technicians who both know how to machine plutonium and, say, build a pit, um, so that the amount of time is probably less. I would have, I mean, uh, I was just told before the talk about the sheer size of Los Alamos still, uh, which, um, and obviously all those people are not technicians, far from it. But I don't think we're talking about immense populations here. We're not talking about at most thousands, but I think even less than that. I think we're talking about hundreds. I mean, think about uh, in one's own community of people whose work that you trust and value. They're, forgive me, small um, and, you know, there's a lot to be said for Steve Shapin's concept of the notion that people's credibility is still very much uh, a personal set of connections. Yes, we go to conferences and wear name tags, which have our affiliations, which do vouch for us. I, please don't, I don't want to under, underestimate that. But there is also a sense in which, you know, there's certain people's papers, and I read them, I know they're right. I know that they're, I know I should trust it. I read a lot of other stuff, and I go, geez, I'm going to have to go back to the archives to figure out if that's true. Okay? So I apologize. I don't have more specific numbers. I'll turn it over to Kathleen for your other question. And your question is, if a uh, specific question, if I remember, is if safety, if s- maybe in the, and I'm thinking more about the Soviet program, if they were concerned about safety of their workers, and if that introduced a level of um, standard that then might May have made it even more difficult for them to, or created some of these delays, or no, in, in the new efforts. In the new efforts, where, where safety might be utmost consideration. So, like <coughs> that, that adds the delay. So, in, in this, developing some of this, in this experiment in particular. Yes, yeah. or rather, I, I think the first one I was thinking more of. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, I think safety could be an issue. I mean, that would be an interesting one to look at, let's say, uh, for example, with the H5N1 controversies recently, if safety played a role in terms of how the the work was structured. I'm sure it did play a role, given that it required special laboratories to actually do that work. Um, uh, so I think uh, when we talk about safety, it's a sort of a case-by-case basis to the, the extent to which that would play a role or not. Like in this particular case, I would say no. Um, that safety really was not um, something that uh, characterized a lot of delays or concerns in this experiment. It was more just even, again, kind of just looking at that little test tube, how do you make that little orange liquid in that test tube? And that was, took a huge amount of just trial and error and work to get that to, to work. 
Back here. <coughs> Yeah, uh, charge and persist are learning. Uh, you have to learn by doing, and also let's take time. For example, in my, I have PhD in physical chemistry in late sixties, and it take me ten years, and uh, I have to maintain the uh, mass spectrometer, so I have to able to read the circles, okay. And also, I need to do the glass blowing, and also I need to work uh, with uh, carpenter, and <laughs> all those uh, kind of technician. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, you just uh, buy the equipment and this that, and so how nowadays how could we get the uh, credible uh, PhD in science? And second is uh, the. Uh, the biology thing. Did U.S. Uh, got the know-how from Japanese uh, mm -hmm. biological and uh, chemical warfare? Japan conducted widely <coughs> the both uh, chemical warfare and uh, biological warfare in China. Mm -hmm. I, I know uh, one province, nowadays people still suffer from anthrax. So my, my basic question is this. I don't know what happened in Japan now, but uh, uh, the US, uh, does the US or Russia have the uh, biological uh, uh, material? I mean to get rid of, such like uh, anthrax. Anthrax is very tough. Are we able to get rid of the anthrax in the environment? Thank you. And some, uh, some other thing. Well, yes, you can buy a mass spectrometer, um, you know, through the catalog. I personally like the fact that you can buy a synchrotron from uh, on a catalog myself. But um, look, uh, <laughs> but the point is that uh, I mean, if you've uh, ever watched, um, I once did it at Hopkins. If you watch a new uh, faculty member set up their laboratory, one of the things they do besides you know go crazy with the catalogs. Um, and always buy the most sophisticated espresso machine known to man, which they can subsequently not figure out how to work, um, is that they calibrate everything. I mean, uh, what I remember most about watching this new faculty member in, um, it was uh, Polite Engineering Physics, uh, was they almost, I, I used to tease them, why'd you buy it? It would have been easier for you to make it because you're just taking the thing apart. And they literally, you know, took the apparatus apart because they wanted to make sure, did it meet the standards it claimed? In other words, they weren't about to uh, write a paper unless they were sure it did it. And by the way, the graduate students really didn't like this. This is part of the culture of becoming a professor, right, is learning. you got to take the thing apart before you can trust it. So, I mean, I envy your working with the carpenters because <laughs> that might have been fun, but... That you still have to do that. That's how we get credible. That is one way we can make claims about credibility. But I'll turn it over to Kathleen. And just to sort of add um, to that, kind of related to this particular experiment, one of the things um, you know that, <coughs> that I learned, and again, kind of probing this experiment in more detail, is that you know there are some labs. So this uh, that orange liquid, it's basically a cell culture process. And what I found in, in terms of my interviews is there are other labs you know, uh, virology labs who essentially <coughs> outsource making that cell culture to, let's say, core facilities, because it's a commercial now, um, it can be a commercial process. You can, different universities have uh, commercial units that will actually make as some aspects of this um, culture for la research labs, let's say, don't want to go through the hassle of doing that. So instead of <coughs> the own lab, they can sort of give the materials to this core facility and then the lab can do it. But what I found in some of my interviews with these scientists is that, for, again, for this particular kind of work, this kind of experimental work, um, they found that the when they farmed some of these materials out to core labs, the experiment would always fail. And so they didn't trust these outsourcing it. And they said, we have to keep this work in the lab because we have these technicians who we know have proven that they can make this stuff. 
um, you know, they do the necessary quality control that we can be assured that then this experiment can work. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting commentary on, you know, buying and outsourcing can help in some ways, but for some kinds of work, it, because of the nature of the work itself, or in biology, I think sometimes the capriciousness of biology, biological materials, that sometimes you, you can't outsource certain things. You just, you have to do them for quality control purposes. Um, uh, in terms of your comment or your question about um, the Japanese program the U.S. did, and I, I think Michael probably has some in-depth historical connections or knowledge to that, but um, the U.S. did uh, receive information about the former Japanese uh, bioweapons program that it did use and incorporate as part of its own offensive program before the U.S. program ended in 1969. So um, it was some medical data that had, the Japanese had provided um, testing on humans, that data that um, the U.S. received that they did not previously have. Um, and uh, your question was also about um, sources of anthrax, or? Yeah, how, how do you encounter that uh, uh, biological uh, animal that you want? How do you require or uh, um, You know, I don't know that you can ever fully <laughs> remediate or destroy, you know, if you have biological materials that are released. And um, you can minimize the extent to which they can be a health concern. Uh, but I don't, you know, I think it's to say that for 100 percent surety that, you know, uh, you can. Then there's a the big problem that uh, uh, the, the kind of anthrax they can use. You can make your, your uh, leg rotten and, and uh, be, be, uh, become bright in nature. And people uh, in the Japan province feel it suffering. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are sort of um, hot spots of agent. Yeah. Okay, Jerry. Jerry Epstein at the Department of Homeland Security. The assumption in, in all the talks is that tacit knowledge is, is, is valuable, valuable if you want to recreate the process. It's, it, it helps you, and that if you don't have it, you're impeded. But another sort of trope of American innovation is that sometimes we say that young people are so successful because they don't know that they can't do things and they figure it out. <laughs> so to what extent might tacit knowledge actually be a drag, and it's better to not have this burden of knowing how other people did it? Well, one thing I would say about that is that, yes, that may be true, but then look at all those internet companies where they always say they need to get an adult. Um, right, and to, to manage it. Um, so uh, it's not, I wouldn't want to confuse tacit knowledge with history per se, right? That is that just because uh, you don't have tacit knowledge doesn't mean you cannot develop new processes or ways to get to an endpoint, right? In other words, there are multiple ways to get to a weapon, uh, right? So you can make different choices, but all of them will require the acquisition of tacit knowledge to work with. So, I mean, think about the Chinese case, right? Uh, because of material constraints, uh, they went to develop an uh, imploded in a U-235 device, which nobody else went with first. I mean, our U-235 device was a gun type, uh, and they knew that, and if they made a decision to go that way. Um, so, Different paths produce different kinds of tacit knowledge. Uh, whether I mean, I think one of the things implicit is that could someone develop a faster, better, you know, sort of cheaper way to do this? Um, I mean, that's been, after all, the whole debate about laser inertial fusion, which Alex Wallerstein is the expert on. That is, could you have fusion? I don't mean cold fusion, but could you have a form of fusion without having a fission reaction first? That's what the NIF. I think is going to test if it ever works. Um, I said Livermore too. Um, so, but I don't think that, I don't buy the premise that uh, you, you young kid, you know, you could be crazy enough to be able to do it. You're going to have tacit knowledge, okay? It just will be different, I think. Kathleen, do you want to? Mm, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of recognizing and maybe that's a useful distinction to make, is when we talk about tacit knowledge, it's not only just 
historical knowledge and recreating that historical knowledge, but it's how do you create the knowledge to do what you want to do, and that may require a new set of skills. Uh, it's, it's a whole issue of test technology. Either you acquire it by training through, let's say, a master apprentice, or you learn by doing it, and so it's two different types. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Dave. Uh, uh, Dave Rajeski at the Wilson Center. Um, I just have a sort of a comment, question about your PCR machine. Um, we're in the process of putting together a do-it-yourself bio lab, <clears throat> and we're going, we're going, we're going to buy a. Which is teaching yourself how to use it, teaching yourself how to validate your results, and then if you really are going to make a public lab, which is really a great idea, like I guess this is going to make the one in Cambridge and the one in Berkeley, um, you know, teaching people how to use it, because and. As a teacher, I can just say that's really the hard part. I mean, it's not a trivial process. Anyway, uh, I don't know that I have anything. To okay. say. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, Nikki Yakopoulos, George Washington University School of Engineering. Um, I'd like to touch upon the subject that also the um, Jerry Epstein uh, touched earlier. It seemed to me your discussion really covered two separate topics. One case is where you're going to reproduce something that was done before, and you want to make sure you maintain that knowledge to do it. And the other case is you invent something new. In the second case, trial and error, I think the old saying it's 99% perspiration and 1% innovation holds, so eventually you build the expertise. In the second case, though, where you have to reproduce something, that's an issue that really has applies not only to weapons of mass destruction, it applies to any technology. I mean, the classical example of that is the, the old story of when General Electric uh, funded the development of expert systems because it was finding out that it's all engineers <coughs> who are retiring and the knowledge was lost, so they wanted that knowledge to be stored someplace for the new people to, to, to gain access to it. Uh, so it seems to me the issue is not just for the weapons, it's true for any technology. Oh, yes, we would not yeah. disagree with that. <laughs> at all. Neither of us. Science studies generally doesn't study weapons anyway. No, no, no. I mean, the expert systems. Uh, and I would just argue, I mean, DOE is engaged in a monster expert system project, right? This whole, the mess of video histories they're doing of, you know, they're, as the designers get older and, you know, they're retiring and, you know, they don't want to live at Livermore or Los Alamos right now. So I know, I know, it's not just that. It, but I would say one thing, replication is not as easy as it looks. The big difference is you know it, will, it can be done. Yes, that removes a significant amount of uncertainty, right? And it allows your government to pay you to build the bomb. Um, but it also allows you to, you know, the story about the Russian bomb that Holloway tells is so wonderful, right? Barry had two pockets in the jacket. The one pocket was if it worked, who gets the order of Lenin, who gets the order of Stalin, blah. And the other jacket, if it fails, who gets shot immediately, who gets internal exile, who gets a show trial, blah, blah, okay? So it reduces the uncertainty, but you still have to learn how to do it, right? Uh, it, that doesn't change. You will have to acquire the knowledge, and it will take you time. But no, I agree. It is true for all products, and it's not just for weapons. I would never want it to be. And just to sort of kind of follow up on that, I mean, one of the things I think that would be useful is, I mean, if you look at sort of business schools or, you know, program, you know, different schools that offer organizational management studies, particularly with technology. I mean, there are a lot of people who are focused on kind of, for various technologies, you know, how, how do you get things to work, um, you know, in terms of across different, you know, transferring knowledge. And, and one of the limitations I see is the security community has not enough sort of said, there's a whole body of people who are interested about knowledge transfer, knowledge development, knowledge maintenance in these other disciplines, um, that this is a common problem of technology, and to reach out to those communities and say, okay, you know, what have they learned about technology that could be useful for us to think about in, in terms of these weapons cases? And something Kathleen's worked on is also that uh, business schools are, I mean, believe it or not, uh, business schools are a hotbed of thought about tacit knowledge these days because they have seen, um, especially through the case studies, it's, a, it's invaluable when it becomes apparent through them. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the session, but I just have a comment and then a question that I think will maybe um, uh, provide an appropriate concluding point given the focus of the series. The comment is, and it's, a, it's really kind of, uh, um, kind of motivated, uh, inspired by kind of what occurred in, 
in Washington this week, which was incredibly neat, which was when Discovery flew over, you know, the Capitol building, and to see, you know, Discovery up there, and 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 as some a kid who grew up in the space era of the space exploration, you get a sense that this is one. There's a group of people that were responsible for building these incredible machines, and and they're going to disperse, and there's a notion that maybe the commercial sector is going to take care of them. I'm really dubious about that. And then, you know, <laughs> NNSA is, is in an era where we're not testing nuclear weapons is going through the same thing on the modernization, which, you know, you started off with, Michael, in your, in your first uh, kind of a, a example. That's sort of the comment. I, it's just a pity that as a society we're losing this. And I read somewhere that, that like, the, tit the, the Saturn V, which was just incredible, you know, heavy launch vehicle, they don't have the plans. I mean, they, they no, no, we have the plans. I mean, they, 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 they you know, big, you know, uh, I, I saw that they lost them. We have the plans. That's very good. They're, they're, I've seen them at the Air and Space Museum. We well, that's have wonderful. I'm glad we have the plans. Whether we could actually build another no, Saturn no, V now, no. I don't know. I think. Anyway, here's here's to the um, appropriate Wilsonian Wilson Center, uh, you know, closure question, which is the question that we looked at today is, you know, the role of tacit knowledge and WD proliferation, past and present. And if you were kind of had, you know, the question that Lee Hamilton used to ask when he was, was director, if you had five minutes with a member of Congress or something, what would be sort of the takeaway? The takeaway to me from what you've said is actually kind of on the good news side since that the last decade we've been worried about this nexus of terrorism and proliferation and that, you know, the old, the, the scenario of the uh, high school physics class that can make an atomic bomb, you know, if they got access to HEU and, and, and um, uh, reports that uh, of what Al-Qaeda, we knew Al-Qaeda was interested, I mean, the stuff they were doing in Kandahar on uh, chemical weapons mm -hmm. as well as, as sort of their interest in nuclear weapons, but that the, 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 the issue, the problem, well, two, two, two kind of aspects of it, that you really need the, the capabilities of a state to do a lot of these things, and, and second, this critical, you know, factor of tacit knowledge, you know, really is, is an impediment on the ability of non-state actors to translate uh, an aspiration or intention into a reality uh, look at the Aum Shinrikyo case, mm -hmm. which we didn't get into on the on the bio mm -hmm. side and the issues of weaponization, such that they're not going to give up, but it's more likely they'll do things like um, uh, try to crash air aircraft into into into, in, into uh, uh, skyscrapers, uh, or what uh, Aum Shinrikyo ended up actually you know doing, which which wasn't you know for, or Timothy McVeigh, you mm -hmm. know. That type of that that type of attack, like mass casualty attacks, but not using kind of exotic technologies. And I'll put a question mark at that because that seems to be to flow from your analysis, um, and w and should be a factor taken into the into account in this debate on this nexus of terrorism and proliferation and this conflation of uh, of, of of WMD terrorism and mass casualty terrorism. Go first. Do we respond or? No, it's just, yeah. it's just no, is it, would that be, it, would that formulation be a, a fair summation of the policy implications of your analysis? Well, I would actually probably back it up a little bit and sort of um, my interest in all of this is I've done my own case studies and sort of seen to really understand know-how in any case, it takes a huge amount of work. And I mean, I think about my own research on the polio virus and Soviet program, it's a lot of work to really, really understand know-how in these specific cases. And so my, my argument would probably be more in terms of a poly response. I would actually like to see, and this is where I ask for more money, um, I mean, I think the intelligence community needs more money to focus on these kinds of issues, to really uh, invest in people who are not just doing the current intelligence reports of the day, but who are actually taken offline for long periods of time to do the really in-depth kind of collection and analysis that's necessary to be able to, um, with confidence, have a better confidence to say, okay, what do we know about know-how in, in past cases and, and in present cases? So um, that's what I would support is, is more resources to the intelligence community to actually focus on really parsing out. Because I think as Michael and I have talked about for, you know, in terms of state-level programs. We're academics. We don't have access to classified information, whereas the intelligence community does. They could sort of actually task and really put out and collect information that we just wouldn't be able to get. 
Um, but they need to be able to be given resources and the time to do that. And so that's sort of what I would say is to better to, to better have a more definitive answer on, on the claim that you're making, I would say the intelligence community needs more resources. I would just say, I mean, I like the notion of what if you get a congressman for five minutes, um, but, uh, but, the th I, but I actually think that in one sense you're right. We are saying that WEP, as you make this distinction, mass casualty and WEP WMD, there are many things to lose sleep over, okay? This may not be one of them. Now, am I being Pollyannish and saying you shouldn't use any? No, of course not. But I'll be quite honest. The notion that anyone will be making a nuclear weapon in a cave is an absurdity to me. Um, now, you may steal a nuclear weapon. That's different. Yeah. Okay? And I'm, uh, and I'm personally quite terrified of, of Pakistan because I have no understanding of how they secure their weapons. But... It, there's a difference between stealing a warhead or a device and manufacturing one from scratch. And I actually think that, you know, chemical and biological, one of the things we, we've we tried to say is that, look, you don't have to make a chemical weapon, right? You just crash something into those plants in Jersey that smell bad when you drive by them on the, uh, 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 you know, on the thruway, okay? That's, you can make a mass casualty event, right? And But that's not a weapon of mass destruction and so anything to downplay some of the uh, you know the sort of security mania would be actually good for I think all of us well unfortunately we have to end I think that it's rare when I can say we've been educated and entertained but I think we have been today thank uh, our panelists <laughs>